Hello. <laughs> okay, I think we'll start. We've got only a few more outside, but everyone else is in. So welcome back to the uh, morning session. Uh, so the next speaker this morning is Sheen Oliver from Imperial, and Sheen's going to give us a, uh, a blackboard talk with some uh, figures on uh, here, some, yeah. some figures on the projector. So thanks, Sheen. <coughs> Okay, yeah, thanks for the invitation to give a talk. So this is a bit of an unusual talk because normally people speak about uh, successful research projects, where this one is about an unsuccessful research project, <laughs> or at least an incomplete one from act actually 2009. So at the time, uh, Phil Trin, who was still a student, and John Chapman asked about uh, a numerical problem related to gravity waves which ultimately led to, uh, they had a couple of papers in uh, JFM in uh, 2013, where they did exponential asymptotics on the problem. But I think what they wanted was some numerical experiments to uh, compare their asymptotics against to make, sh make sure that they were correct, I assume. And essentially the problem was uh, it sort of flow over a step. So you had the bottom of a channel, a river, I guess, would look like this. <coughs> and it was sort of a free boundary problem where the solution looks like this. So it's flat on the left. and uh, periodic on the right. And I think there's actually another function here called uh, theta. Okay, so essentially this is the kind of thing we want to be able to compute numerically. is a function that's supported on all of our uh, constant, or you could think of it as periodic on one side, but uh, con constant is a special case of periodic and periodic on another side, we don't necessarily know the period, uh, and we need to capture functions like this, which hopefully I realize most people here are not numerical analysts, but I'm sure you can appreciate the difficulty in a function that's supported on the whole real line, but also infinitely oscillatory on, on one side. Okay. And the qu equation they gave me, which is slightly different from the one in the paper, so I don't know which one is correct, but I'll just write the one that I have here in the, uh, the notes is, it's sort of a mixture of a differential, so this is relating the blue and the red curve. You'll have to ask Phil or John physically where this comes from. It, it, it actually comes from you take this domain and conformally map it first to a strip and then to the half plane and then use sort of standard complex analysis tricks, but I, I, I won't dwell on that. Okay, so you get this term, which I'm gonna call H tilde theta of T. This is sort of like a Hilbert transform, and in fact it has a Hilbert-like uh, so I should put a principal value integral there. It has a Hilbert singularity, a pole, when t equals tau, but it's sort of a slightly perturbed version of the Hilbert transform. Okay. Q is a unknown, and what you're given is a function coming from the behavior of the step. That's sort of the, you're given the bottom behavior. And this function, one example would be something like square root um, two plus e to the minus t over one plus e to the minus t. So basically a step that at minus infinity <coughs> is equal to one and then smoothly goes up to two. So a smooth function. So this is a function for t on the real line. So it's, uh, here, theta is a function of t, as is q. Um, 
we're given a smooth function, and we know the solution will look sort of like this. Q and theta will behave, have this behavior. Okay. So now, uh, as I said, this is an unsuccessful uh, talk on unsuccessful research, so I'm not going to be able to solve this equation, but I'm going to try to relate it to something where we can do some numerics for uh, other equations that are similar to this, have similar solutions, and, and talk a bit whether what would need to be done to actually solve this, this problem. Okay, so the first thing to note is, as I sort of mentioned, H tilde can be thought of as the regular Hil Hilbert transform plus uh, something nice. So here, uh, here, H is equal to, uh, let's, let's write it like this, H U of T for a function is uh, one over pi integral minus infinity infinity. This is just a regular Hilbert transform, U of tau um, T minus tau D tau. Okay, and K, so this sort of, captures the singular part of this, this integral operator, h tilde, and the other part is, is um, I'll, I'll just say it's something nice. It doesn't have a singularity. So this has sort of removed the singularity. I won't say much more about the structure of this operator, but this is sort of how we're going to think about things. And so we can really think of this problem, if you do a bit more, uh, uh, simplifications, we can think of it as in a sort of more general form. So I'll say after simplifications, as a differential equation mixed with a singular integral Hilbert transform, uh, you can sort of see if we sort of do some manipulations of this, we get that it's sort of uh, u is related, q is related to theta like this, so this is sort of has a similar feature to it. And then you can sort of bundle everything else up in sort of a nonlinear term, which has a feature that this can involve uh, non-local uh, integral operators. Okay, so we're not necessarily thinking of this as a just a function of u at a point, v at a point. These are, uh, this is a function of functions. So you can, for example, involve this k operator apply to you. Okay, so this is essentially what we want to solve. Uh, where does that exponentially small par part come in? Uh, I should probably mention that, is when epsilon goes to zero, these os the height of these oscillations beca decays exponentially. And if you did a sort of asymptotic expansion of this, you only get smooth behavior. You don't, you don't see any of the facilitatory behavior. Okay. <coughs> the other feature we have is it's periodic, and here, this means as t goes to infinity, our equation becomes an uh, autonomous equation. Okay. Okay. So, and the, the last thing I want to mention as, is set up. So in the t going to infinity range, we're now interested in just periodic solutions. And for periodic functions, the Hilbert transform is in many ways similar to a derivative. OK, so what do I mean by this? Well. We all know if we have a, a 4A mode and we take its derivative, we get um, uh, 
i k e to the i k t. The Hilbert transform, on the other hand, I'll do minus the Hilbert transform is equal to um, i sine k. So what I mean by like here is that they have, here we have k, we have sine k, they have the same sign, they have the same kernel, they have a lot of sort of features in common, okay? So there is sort of how we're gonna get our model problem, our toy problem, that's gonna help us build up to this, this real world problem is we're gonna replace the Hilbert transform for a derivative, and then we just get a classic second order order E, but one that's, um, uh, non-autonomous, but before we talk about the non-autonomous case, we want to talk about the autonomous case. So how do we compute, and this is a very classic problem, the periodic orbits of autonomous ODEs numerically? Because remember, we don't, need the, we don't know the period, so probably we'll have to figure out the period when we get to the real problem. So that's sort of the setup of the rest of the talk, is first I'll talk about autonomous uh, ODEs, and I really mean periodic solutions. And the sort of magic here is if you don't think of it as a differential equation, as sort of time stepping, if you think of it in terms of Fourier series, it doesn't actually matter that it's an ODE. You can, the exact same techniques also work for Hilbert transforms. So here, everything will translate over to this sort of more general setting. Okay, so how do we numerically compute periodic solutions to autonomous ODEs. Okay. The next part is, so that, I mean, that's fairly classic, but we're really interested in this non-autonomous case where we have this transition fr between two periodic behaviors. So, but rather than having to deal with the Hilbert transform now, we'll just change it to a derivative and see what happens. So then we're gonna talk about non-autonomous Uh, ODEs that have this transition, so that at what uh, in the limit they become autonomous, and then finally we'll talk about the problem that we really want to solve: that general form of uh, of non-autonomous uh, ODEs slash SEIEs, and I'll put a question mark there because that's not quite done. Okay, so that's the plan for the talk. So let's start with something really simple. Just a for, first order ODE that's autonomous. Okay. And this could be something like, like epsilon u squared. Okay. How can we find periodic solutions? So then let's say we're given, obviously if it's zero, uh, we know the answer is zero. If you're close to zero, it's gonna look roughly like e to the i, uh, i t. Uh, if we're given some initial condition, which is uh, small. So we're in this sort of regime of sort of periodic orbits. Uh, the solution space would look something like this. I think it has sort of this, for this example, it has some Think some, uh, no, that can't be right. There's some line, there's some line where it sort of has a degeneracy, but we're sort of near this. Uh, this is the real and imaginary part. Okay, so at zero, we're just zero. We want to figure out these periodic orbits. And the nice thing about a first order ODE is it turns out the period is like this, the period is exactly two pi. So at least in this case, we know the period. Uh, now, there's many ways you can do this, uh, but I, I'm gonna, 
introduce a way that will sort of extend to the non-autonomous setting. Okay. So we want to solve this ODE, and we're going to do it as a fixed point problem. What I mean is u is equal to d dt minus i. So if we move this over here, we get d dt minus i u is equal to f of u. And basically, we want to just invert this. The problem is because it has a kernel, we can't necessarily invert it. So I'll say we'll, we'll do some sort of pseudo inverse of this. So th this is going to be a method that works. I'll define what a pseudo inverse is. But if we start with an initial guess of what these periodics are, uh, say, so here u will have a Fourier expansion. Uh, I'll say u naught, our initial guess. will have some given probably finite Fourier, uh, Fourier expansion, but I'll just, this, this will actually be finite, but I won't, I, I won't write that. Okay, so uh, then we'll apply f. If u is periodic, f of u is periodic, so then we can obviously find a, Fourier expansion for V. Now we want to apply the pseudo inverse to V naught. And the way we do that is I plus will just be equal to apply to V a function v will just be equal to the true inverse. And if we make sure, so the problem why d dt minus i doesn't have an inverse is if, you, if it has a kernel, if you never hit e to the uh, i t. But if you sort of subtract off, so I'm applying this to let's say v naught. If I subtract off v naught, uh, This then lies in the range of the operator, so then we can have an inverse. And then you just add in the boundary condition. Uh, I think we need to call this thing W. Okay, so, and the point is, and then in, in applied to Fourier series, this has a very simple expression. It's just one, one over i, so on. Uh, it's a bounded operator in whatever space you want to work in. And therefore, and then f is a contraction mapping. And doing this, this is a contraction. The six point iteration is a con contraction. Uh, and therefore, it will converge to something, and sort of by uniqueness, it will converge to the right thing. So what I mean here is uh, this will be our next iteration, and then we iterate. So then we plug uh, we plug u1 into f, expand it, apply the pseudo inverse, get the next, we get u2 plug it in, it, and, and so, so forth. OK. And because we've got in the period, period right, it all works. OK. Any questions? Is that sort of clear? So now, for second order, So this is an, uh, okay, so now our equation might look like u prime v prime equal uh, 
we could have something like this. This would be sort of a standard example plus zero f of u. Uh, if this were, say, u minus sine u, we get the uh, classic uh, pendulum. OK. So I suspect most people know what this sort of looks like if you look at the solution space here. You have sort of periodic orbits like this. But here the problem is the period is not 2 pi. So in the first order case, it was everything proceeded straightforward. Uh, here the period is not 2 pi. And this is, of course, uh, a classic example of where Lin said, uh, Poincaré comes in for asymptotics. You can asymptotically figure out the period. But we, do, we don't want to do asymptotics here. We want to do numerics. So how do we compute these periodic orbits for uh, the pendulum equation? Well, there uh, was a paper in 2001 by uh, Vis Viswanath, Devakar Viswanath in uh, Maybe I'll, I'll leave that one there. Uh, who's a professor in Michigan, a former student of Nick Trefeden, who had a paper on precisely this, computing periodic order orbits of second order differential equations using Fourier series. So what's the trick? Well. Let's sort of diagonalize this, so then our equation is u prime v prime is equal to i u minus i v. So if we just diagonalize the matrix to uh, plus, I'll put some capital F, possibly with an epsilon. Uh, again, we can just do fixed point iteration on this. And then, of course, we'll have u0, v0 is equal to u0, v0. You can do fixed point iteration on this, which is u, v is equal to now uh, I guess we could write it like this, v dt minus i plus v dt plus i plus. F epsilon u v. So now this is still going to be, so this will still be a contraction. Uh, these are still bounded operators, so the whole thing is a contraction. So this will converge. This is a contraction. which means that it converges to something, but it's not necessarily the right thing because this plus, these pseudo inverses are only true inverses if the, uh, where did I define the pseudo inverse? If that first Fourier coefficient is zero. So it will converge to something if that first Fourier coefficient to zero, it's the correct thing. It solves the differential equation. Um, if that's not zero, it's the wrong thing. So how do we uh, deal with this? Well, we know the period is not going to be exactly 2 pi. So we can do a change of variables. So we can define. So this is going to be the true period, omega. Uh, 
we know if, as long as our periodic orbit is close enough to the uh, equilibrium point, it'll be about one, but it'll be slightly off one. So as long as our initial condition is close enough to zero, the period will be about one. And then when you do the substitution, we get a similar equation, which is a similar fixed point iteration. But now we have this correction coming from the fact that we don't know the period. I think I need an omega here in front of the F. Okay. Okay. So now for any given omega, omega will be sufficiently close to one. This will be a contraction. That's still a contraction. This will converge to something. Now we choose omega. So that our pseudo inverses, so it converges to something. We check the fir first Fourier coefficients. I guess this would be the first Fourier coefficient. That'd be the minus first one. Uh, so that these inverses, these pseudo inverses, become true inverses. Uh, Okay, so you ch guess a frequency. It, yep. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. So we guess a frequency, uh, run it until it converges, check whether these Fourier coefficients are zero. If they're not, we know we got the frequency wrong. Uh, so we want to choose omega so that the frequencies are zero, uh, w which means that essentially we want to do a root finding problem. We want to find the omega that makes these coefficients vanish. So essentially, from a numerical point of view, we want to do Newton iteration on omega, this frequency. Okay. Uh, and with modern computers, you can just auto-differentiate. You can auto-differentiate this uh, fixed point iteration and just get out derivatives very easily. So I'll just put plus auto diff. Okay. Okay, so that's the autonomous ca case. Uh, oh yeah, there's a key point, which is everything I said would work just as well for Hilbert transforms. So if I wanted to, for example, in my problem I, I want to solve, I want to figure out what possible periodic orbits exist. I can do that already using this framework because nothing, I, nothing in this construction used the fact that ddt was a derivative. Everywhere you see ddt, I could replace with h. And for periodic functions, we know h is as a simple expression. So, uh, So let me just say, so there's a key observation. Uh, so we did have to do this u tilde, v tilde, this change of variables here. And we sort of implicitly use the fact that when we do that for a derivative, we know that's equivalent to multiplication of the derivative. Uh, something similar is true for Hilbert transforms. If I apply the Hilbert transform for a rescaled function, that's the same as applying the Hilbert transform for that means we can do this with H instead of D DT. Okay. So this is why this way of 
doing it numerically is uh, useful for the problem we're actually trying to solve. Okay. So now let's switch to <coughs> non autonomous ODEs. I think I'll write down an example. How am I doing for time? I guess I'm okay for time. Okay. So let me write down a simple example of a first order ODE that looks similar to the thing that we're actually trying to solve as sort of a motivation. First order example, which is I epsilon Q naught. Q naught is again this step function, square root two plus e to the minus t over this. Q cubed. And the solutions actually look essentially exactly like this, except the blue is the real part of Q and the red is the imaginary part. Okay. So it's inhomogeneous because Q naught depends on T, but as T goes to infinity, it becomes periodic. Okay. So, and then we can, this is just an ODE, so we can think more conceptually that this is something coming from the left and integrating, and so we can just say that this initial condition is this. Okay. Well, we want to sort of first uh, reduce this to um, a more canonical form, which is pretty straightforward. So if we, uh, if we define, so we kind of want to get rid of this uh, Q naught and regularize it. Actually, I can't write that. Uh, so Q naught is a thing that starts from one, uh, is like a smooth step. If I cube it, it'll still be a smooth step. And if I integrate it, it'll be sort of uh, linear or affine at minus infinity and affine at plus infinity. So it'll sort of look like like this, where the, it's sort of a straight line at minus infinity or a straight line at positive infin infinity with slightly different slope. And if I define uh, u of t as q of the inverse of this function, the functional inverse, uh, t over epsilon minus q naught the inverse t over epsilon, we then get a nice equation. for some f. Okay. So, so essentially this is the equation we want to solve. This is our simple model problem of a non-autonomous first order ODE. Uh, and with the right setup, we get something that looks very much like the solutions that, of the actual problem we want to solve. But now we can sort of just consider this. 
and how do we transition from this uh, from this non-oscillatory to this oscillatory thing? And because it's first order, we have this good feature that we know the period. We know that as t goes to infinity, it turns into an autonomous ODE, and we know the period is exactly two pi. So at least it's simple enough that we know the period. Okay. So we're still going to use a uh, fixed point iteration. So we want to solve this equation. I can actually write inverse as it will be clear in a second. where uh, so this is just a simple first order RDE so it has a very simple expression as as um, Okay, so now because we're not dealing with periodic things, I can just write down inverse in the sense that there's just an explicit formula uh, and we don't have this uh, issue with the kernel because we're assuming that it's, uh, the way I've set things up, u goes to zero at minus infinity, uh, so the the switch on of the oscillations is coming from the app. Okay. Okay. But now we can't just plug in a 4A series for U because our solution is not itself periodic. So we need a different ansatz for what the solutions look like. So instead of 4A, we're going to use something called uh, modulated 4A. So essentially the idea is we want a basis of functions or a way of representing these functions, these solutions, so that we can do these different operations. We can apply F and we can apply this sort of inverse DDT minus I inverse. And a natural one is uh, modulated 4A, which comes from, um, at the time, so this was 2009, there was a, a lot of people in uh, time seppy methods looking at these sorts of expansions. So I'll just put a few of the names. Uh, uh, Lubick, Cohen, and there's others too, okay. So here the idea is we want to represent our solution instead of uk e to the ikt, we let the coefficients in the Fourier series depend on t. Okay, each of these will itself be a, sort of a smooth step. So each of these will be zero and sort of switch on to some constant. Okay. So 
but it's not just a Fourier series because these coefficients are changing as, as time. Okay. Uh, I should say that this implies U K of T can be represented uh, in a variety of ways, but uh, we could say map the real line to minus one one and use uh, a Chebyshev expansion. Okay. Okay, so that's going to be our idea. Instead of 4A, now our coefficients defined, depend on T, and behind the scenes, we're approximating it by a map pol polynomial series. Okay. So this is kind of a funny thing to do. So if I write, what I've basically done is I've changed the 1D problem and made it 2D. So this is really 2D in disguise. I basically have here a tensor product expansion of Chebyshev with Fourier. So So if I just call this T Y, we see that it's, and if I expanded this in this Chebyshev expansion, that would just be a sort of expansion of a function on a rectangle. Well, an infinite rectangle, zero to pi. Essentially, I'm created a function that really wants to live in this rectangle. And then, but I'm only using it on uh, the diagonal. Okay. So this is a, a kind of a funny thing to do because, so any function that goes to, that's a tensor product of something periodic in Y uh, and <coughs> has this behavior at plus or minus infinity can be expanded in this. And if I change change, say, one function here, it doesn't actually change it on the di diagonal. Okay, so this is not in any sense unique. We can expand a single solution in many ways, because any expansion, we could just change, say, add like a Gaussian here and get another expansion, and it would still approximate the same function on the diagonal. Okay. But the important thing is, once we have the tensor product thing, if we have a fun function in the rectangle, we can clearly apply a function to it and re-expand. So in the 2D way of thinking about things, the first step of the fixed point iteration, the, uh, the applying f of ut, we can do. So if we have an initial guess, in this form, we can clearly apply a function to it because we can apply a function to the 2D thing. So the only thing left is applying this inverse operator to this expansion. Okay. And that's actually pretty straightforward. Well, so if we apply, so what I said is that we can uh, we can expand. Given a u, we can expand. V of T and make it 2D. So we can expand V in the same basis. So we can think of uh, ha having F of U 
expanded in the same form. And then we can apply this to V. This here is the sum of some functions depending on T, E to the IKT is just um, sum of E to the IKT D DT minus 1 minus KI inverse BK. Okay. So applying this to our expansion is the same as applying very similar inverse operators to each of the uh, each of the components. Okay. So let's uh, consider So we really want to s understand this object here uh, with a general fr frequency applied to a function that behaves like this, is like a smooth step function. Uh, and this is, of course, e to the i omega t. But as t goes to infinity, this is asymptotic to e to the i omega t time. So as, if we plug in t equal to infinity here, we just get the Fourier transform. OK. Uh, so that's. I think I'll just jump ahead to the uh, point. So what, what's the point? So this is telling us that this operator will give us something that's oscillatory. It also gives us something non-oscillatory, which maybe that's less, less, so, less clear, but it's, it's true. And so what we end up getting is uh, minus i inverse times terms like this will give us uh, some nice operator times the same frequency plus another nice operator, actually, I, uh, yeah, times e to the i t. So these two are 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 nice. And we can do them numerically. I won't go into the details. And that, but this implies that we can run our fixed point iteration. We can apply our fun function, expand it, apply the inverses. Each term will contribute to both the case term but also the first one. Okay. The only possible issue is when, when k is precisely one, it's just a derivative, so we're just integrating. If that doesn't go to zero at infinity, that's our, that's our only issue. So th this was for, uh, I'm running out of time, so I'll just say very briefly uh, for, because I wanted to show things on the second order, uh, right, again, u tilde t is equal to u omega t u tilde uh, v tilde t equals v omega t, uh, both uh, modulated Fourier. You expand in this modulated Fourier and choose omega q 
choose omega so that um, so that I'll just say say it this way f of u v t it's it's um, first for a coefficient is equal to zero so that we don't have to integrate um, functions that blow up. But essentially you can choose the frequency so that our sol solution be behaves nice. Okay, so let me switch. Uh, and finally, since I'll, I'll switch to the com computer in a second, this extends to the Hilbert transform since, and there's a nice paper by uh, Trogdon in uh, 2016, h times vk e to the i k t is e also equal to, uh, well, actually, i sine k vk of t e to the i k t plus some nice operator So, so this is sort of how we would finish the final step, which hasn't been done. But it's this whole, the important thing is that this operator can be split in this way, and the same can be done with Hilbert transforms. Okay. So let's just see. Uh, In the last couple seconds, let's just see this uh, algorithm in action. So let's start with the first order ODE. Uh, so we started with an initial guess. We apply the function, and then we do the solve, and then we get two terms. And then we apply the function again. That gives us more Fourier mode. So this is the this is. So this is the non-autonomous setting. Each of these are those coefficients that are constant at either n times some Fourier mode. So here we have two Fourier modes. This is a modulated Fourier series where I'm plotting the coefficients of the expansion. Okay. <coughs> so then when we apply f to that, we get a lot more modes, but they're sort of nicely decaying. And then we can apply the operator again. And as we do this over and over again, it sort of well, the picture is jumping around, but it's converging. And we can truncate our Fourier expansion, we can truncate our Chebyshev expansions, each of these are, are represented by map Chebyshev expansions, and we see eventually it converges. Okay. And here, this is a first order example, we see that we've captured this uh, oscillatory behavior and the error is quite small, and actually I think the error is coming from the ODE solver, not this numerical method. Okay. Uh, so again, we can do this with the second order case, but now we don't know the period. Um, <coughs> so what happens is if we get the period wrong, we have these two prob problem things. So here I've applied F, to our iterate, and now I'm trying to do the inverse operators. So I, I want to now integrate this. Um, these two terms are not vanishing. So that's where, how we choose the frequency, is so that these terms vanish at infinity, and so when I integrate, essentially I want to integrate each of these terms, uh, I want this to make sense. I don't want it to blow up. Uh, I can replace this with a pseudo inverse. It'll converge to something, I check, to see whether what it's converged to satisfies the right properties, and if it does, I know I have the right omega. And so that's how I can do this two-step process of a fixed point iteration with the wrong period, and then use Newton iteration on top of that to find the right period. Okay. And this gives us, uh, for a second order version of this problem, it works and we get solutions that look like this. Okay. And then the last part, which isn't done, would be adding in the Hilbert transforms. But, 
All right, I'll stop there. Nathan. Okay, are there any questions for Shane? Phil? Yeah, oh, sorry. yeah so uh, why didn't you do the Hilbert transform? What's, what's hard about putting in the Hilbert transform? That I, uh, I just thought of it uh, last Friday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, be, because I hadn't looked at this since um, in 13 years. And then, so the key thing, the key difference between 2009 and now is uh, the, uh, this method by Tom Trogdon, which I didn't have time to go into the details, but. Uh, and I guess, so um, if, you put surf if you put surface tension into this, you'll get upstream waves, but the period for the upstream will be different from the period for the downstream. Right. Could you, so now you can, you have, uh, same same philosophy. Can you do this thing with uh, iterating, but now with the possibility of two periods? Right. So I think you would need. So I I sort of had something similar here, where I had that g function with different angles, and then in that case I could do things analytically, and that was in some sense making the periods the same. So I think probably that's what you would want to do: is you would have some smooth function instead of e to the i k you have e to the i k g of t, which captures a transition from one period to the, to the other. Uh, other than that, the expansion, there was nothing that really depended on it being constant on the left, because I could have my steps not go to zero on the left, and I would get something periodic. So you could capture the, yeah, different periods. Thank you. So uh, Shane, you, you, motivation here is that for small epsilon, waves are exponentially small. Is there anything about this that relies on epsilon being small? Is this uh, 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 not explicitly, but uh, epsilon being small sort of ensures that you have a contraction mapping, so that guarantees that the fixed point iteration will converge. So maybe not for epsilon order one. Right, but but the nice thing is, like numerically, you can capture those exponentially small yeah. terms, and I, it it should be like uh, asymptotically accurate because. The lower, uh, the smaller epsilon is, the faster the iterations mm. converge. So in some sense, it's capturing the uh, this, these exponential small asymptotics. But and and this is okay. The, the the wavelength here decays algebraically as it happens. This uh, is is this a problem in, with epsilon? Uh, the wavelength. The wavelength dec decays algebraically with epsilon. Is it right? Uh, so. Uh, what, what it, it, there's not a problem with that. Uh, I'm probably misunderstanding. There is a problem that you know the leading order asymptotics are uh, large compared to the oscillations. So when epsilon is really small, uh, you'll get underflow. And so you would only get the, the leading order term. So if, if, if the exponential small parts are below 10 to the minus 16, I don't, I don't think this way of representing the solution will work. But. Okay. Uh, any any last quick question before we have lunch? So we've, if you remember, we've just gone over time. We started late. Uh, we'll go over for lunch, and lunch is at Churchill, uh, and we will reconvene at two thirty in the afternoon. And my understanding is there's only one more talk in the afternoon, unless that's to be updated. So that'll be um, two thirty to to three thirty. Okay, so thanks again to, oh, sorry, just one more. I don't go anywhere. Thank you. So Gerald's got a comment about travel, I think. So, <laughs> both. Um, a comment about the travel um, form. So there were three matches of pairs of people going to the same place at the, roughly the same time. But there was also a misunderstanding from the uh, administrators about who was going to be paying for this. And it seems that basically they're just going to help us make bookings. And then you can request 
reimbursement, but there's no guarantee what's going to happen. So I apologize for that, but there was just a complete misunderstanding of what I was told and what uh, Inish was subsequently told. It just happened to be different. Um, so the pairs are Daniele and Rudolf, so you're going to the same place more or less the same time. And Sandipan Baderji and I will be going somewhere at the same time. And Michal, you and uh, Jin An are going roughly the same time. Okay. And everybody else, please talk to Joy, who's the workshop coordinator, and possibly also the travel people to get this sorted out. Okay? Thanks. <laughs>